The Doctor is in with Dr. Wendy Walsh. Well, the studio looks so different. Just the attitude in here is just uh, relaxing. We have a couch. We have a couch. We have a mo. I've never seen Mo somebody... Kelly. What's your Twitter? How come it's not coming up? It's Mr. Mo Kelly. M R Mr. M O K E. Yeah, I got it. Got it. Got it. There we go. I've I'm never... tweeting the picture of you <laughs> on my couch because I've never seen anybody so relaxed. Just to begin with, he's just in it. In the zone. He's lying down. There's the first person who lie down on my couch. Usually, well, Chris they sit up. Chris kind of did a three quarter lay down. He slouched a bit. Yeah, he. But he just has handle bad, bad posture. Upright. Yep. Ken, John, Pro-belt. sorry, John was upright. Yep. I didn't know. Moe's relaxed. Yeah, the, the key, Mo, is you've got to be an open book. We've got to be able to get in there and read those pages. Oh, I. Well, not me, but Dr. I Wendy. have no concerns. Good. Okay. All so right. can we get going? Well, let's uh, just a, just a quick uh, primer here uh, or primer, uh, yeah. depending on where you're from. <laughs> We've done this in the past a couple of times with different hosts uh, where it's just, if nothing else, a basic get to know Insert name of host here a little bit better. In a deeper way. In a deeper way. It also gives uh, people an idea of maybe questions that you would ask in a professional setting. Yep. I mean, and people obviously- are welcome to tweet me questions that I can ask Mo Kelly mm-hmm. at Dr. Wendy Walsh. Excellent. Dr. Wendy Walsh as we go along the way. I love it when clinicians often will tweet Ooh, me. Oh, that's other- interesting. Psychologists that. will come in with others. So we like to call this our drive-by makeshift therapy session yes <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like handle on the law because it's abbreviated i mean yep. this would obviously be in a in a much more relaxed environment than a radio studio but it would still. also be private mm-hmm. and confidential uh, we're, hey but pretend like we're not here hey mo just so you know nobody's Shannon and listening I, we're, we're, nobody's we're, yeah, listening we're not here <laughs> i'm listening <laughs> You don't remember okay. anything anyhow. So. All right. Uh, Dr. Wendy, this okay. is Mo. Mo, this is Dr. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Mo Kelly. How are you? Hi, Dr. Wendy. Uh, well, before we go begin, I just want to say that I, first of all, the biggest feeling, uh, you know what? When a therapist has a feeling toward a patient, that's called a counter-transference. Mm. So I like to get it out on the table. The biggest counter-transference I have towards Mo is gratitude, because did you know he trained me? No. Like, I'd never done talk radio, and Robin Bertolucci, our program director, said, here, like, take her and make her... And like he held my hand for a whole week while oh, I was shaking. This, and now you're a beautiful this, flower, which the is The student has become the teacher here. <laughs> so this weird. is what we would call a conflict of interest <laughs> <laughs> in the business. Or a dual relationship, right. <laughs> which also would be bad. Um, okay, Mo, so at the beginning, I just want you to describe your childhood for me. Um, I was first living in a house in the heart of Los Angeles around 92nd Street and Western. And I bring that up because that was where I first had an idea of neighborhoods and relationships around me. It was a mostly black neighborhood. And my parents had bought that house uh, just prior to me being born. In fact, I was not supposed to be born. My mother had come out to California in advance to find work. My father was still in Washington, D.C., finishing up a work assignment as a teacher. So they were apart for about maybe six or seven months, if I have the story correct. And then my father came out as he was moving to California to, to, with the rest of the family. I have an older sister. And then they always remind me I was a mistake, not intended, but they can tell me about the night in which I was conceived because my parents had been apart for so long. Oh, and he brought a little Mo with him from yeah. D.C. Fireworks. That's, that's right. All right. Uh, so how does it feel like the uh, I know that, you, you know, you're jokingly saying you were told that you were a mistake. But did your parents give you lots of love and this was said in jest or is there a piece of you that was kind of like, what? Oh, it was completely in jest, but it was serious in the the sense that they did not intend to have another child. My mother is an only child. My father is an only child. My sister's husband is an only child. They have one child. I I come from a very small family. So when my parents say that they probably only planned, planned to have one child, that's very realistic. And there you came along. Uh, uh, yes, I was determined to be and here. <laughs> how would you describe their parenting style? Very, very strict, very rigid. Mm. Uh, my father was a, very much a physical disciplinarian. Mm. Um, there were consequences to not doing as you were told. My parents were firm proponents of corporal punishment. My father would spank 
at the drop of a hat, be it with a belt or with his hands. or And at the t- I grew up fearing my father because of those consequences. But as an adult, I appreciate him because I understood he wanted to keep me out of jail in the morgue. Mm. And there are certain things, and I'm a firm believer that you can't reason with children all the time in the sense of being able to explain to them the difficulties and dangers of life out there. Uh, in other words, when I would run out into the street, my father, father tapped my ass up many times because it wasn't about punishing me, but being able to explain to me in a way that I could not understand at that time that I was putting my life in danger. But I could understand getting swatted. Did you feel protected by this? I felt protected in a general sense. I I never felt that I had to worry about my, where my next meal was coming from or whether my parents meant me harm. Very strict environment, but I never had to believe or even ask myself the question of whether they were on my side or whether they were being abusive. Mm-hmm. And also there were, it's a cultural style. In other words, everyone else had corporal punishment probably in your neighborhood, right? So I don't, I don't, well, I don't know if it was a cultural style, but it was a generational style. Yeah, I will for say, sure, definitely say that. Um, that's how my, fa- my father did not know his father growing up. My mm. father's father died when he was five. First went blind from moonshine, then died because of alcoholism mm. soon thereafter. Mm. Um, my pa- father was an only child, but he had a lot of extended family in terms of cousins and so forth. My father's mother, I think, was like one of ten. Mm -hmm. So we had other father figures which were around. But my father grew up in the projects of Lynchburg, Virginia. So he was coming to the idea of fatherhood with with not a lot of training, you could say. How old was he when your sister was born? My sister was born in 66. He was born in 39. So he was maybe 27. Okay. All right. So the reason why I said cultural, because when children experience stuff that we might look at as abuse— but yet it's just normal in the culture. Like, for instance, in, uh, you know, historic England, where they would send seven-year-olds off to boarding school. Nowadays, we would look at that and go, oh, you know, the attachment injuries. But if everybody did it and it was the Hopi way, then it, the perception of it as feeling hurtful. I mean, even though corporal punishment, I'm not a big believer in it for children. I'm not a big believer. I'm an, a disbeliever completely <laughs> that it's good for children. But within the context of the generation, as you mentioned— and the culture, it, I'm getting from you that maybe you didn't find it. Well, but there was always an explanation. Mm. If I did something, my father would put me, like if you were sitting on the couch, he would put me right in between his knees. And I knew what was coming. Ooh. But he took time to explain to me, I'm Why? getting ready to whoop your ass because of X, Y, and Z. And understand that with every decision that you make, every step that you take, there are consequences to those actions. And right now, it's going to be this belt. But later on in life... It'll be something else. Could be something you else. chose to do this. Now this is the result. Don't people who are believers in corporal punishment say that that's the way you should do it if you're going to do it for the safety of the child? You never do it out of anger or uh, never frustration. Never do it when you're mad. Or, no. Yeah, but just for the safety, like you running out into the middle of the street. That is a safety spanking when you come back, when he goes and grabs you. Yeah, they say you're not supposed to do it out of anger, but my father was angry many times, or at least in my limited understanding of what anger was. All I know was he was yelling at me, he was screaming at me, and he was spanking Mm. me, but there was still some context as far as the why. Why? Mm. Exactly. Uh, What kind of relationship did you have with your mom? Wait for that, because we'll come back. That's a great question to come back to. No word yet about mom. We went through a whole segment. He never brought her up. Gary and Shannon will continue. <laughs> Dr. Wendy Walsh is here as well. Uh, Mo Kelly as well. And we'll come back with more on this.